There's always going to be a war. That's the way it is today. I mean, I'm not sure why the wars come as they come, but they do. There's always going to be soldiers that are getting sent over there and that are coming back not right. There are effects of war. A lot of veterans are out there right now in the streets, and they and they are uh, they homeless. Veterans out there that are lonely, uh, empty inside. Uh, they still struggle. Returning home from Vietnam, I realized that the uh, Vietnam War had not really ended. It was just the beginning of another war, the post-war. Just the, the coming home process, which was very traumatic, in addition to the the uh, type of fighting in Vietnam. In in Vietnam. I saw and did the most violent, cruel things. And you come home and then you're told, stop. No more. They taught me how to survive and keep alive when, when I was overseas, but they didn't ever teach me what to do when I came back. I would really like to just start my new life. One of the main reasons, one of the main traumas of, of uh, vets uh, in the coming home process, that whole quiet, that cold chill of not uh, anyone asking, you know, being afraid to or not wanting to for whatever reason. They need a foundation because they don't have anywhere else to turn. I need you to just stay with me. I hear you. I know you're upset. I know you don't want to be redeployed. I just need some time to work with you. Chad Meshad is the person who is probably more responsible than anybody else for the creation of the Vietnam veteran centers around the country. He, he's, he's a very, very important American. He has earned his degree in his master's degree in psychiatric social work from Florida State University. And he's received all kinds of awards. He's been on 60 Minutes, he's been on 2020, he's been on all the networks. He is probably among the four or five best known veterans of the Vietnam War. Now we'd have him here for all those reasons, but we also have him here because he has a one heck of a story to tell about his life, and I know you're going to welcome him warmly. Shad me Shad. Well, I'm Shad me Shad. I served with the Medical Service Corps in 1969 in Vietnam. I'm the president and founder of the National Veterans Foundation. The foundation was set up at the end of uh, November of 1985 on paper we became uh, known as the Vietnam Veterans Aid Foundation and uh, that whole story is pretty interesting because this was not something I dreamed up to do it was something I was coaxed to do. I was a, a young student and uh, enrollee back in the 60s and uh, actually got uh, commissioned in 66 as a second lieutenant in, uh, in the infantry. And I, and I also went from a second lieutenant in infantry to a captain in one transfer, skipped my first lieutenant's bars, went right into being a captain because I was a mental health professional. In my first year, I went to uh, Fort Leavenworth because I had done most of my work in, uh, in my uh, master's program in criminology and corrections. And, and so they sent me to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. At the Leavenworth prison there was, uh, was where it all started for me because I got to talk to guys that had come back and you know they would be in my rap groups and I'd see them individually. There was another officer that had just arrived that got orders to go to Vietnam and I talked my commanding officer into switching. And, and I ended up going and doing my last year in Vietnam and I came back and within about five months ended out here in LA. And uh, by that time I had uh, I had literally ziplocked or bagged 360 plus 18, 19, and 20 year olds. I went to a cocktail party my first night here at USC and met uh, Dr. Phil May, who was, was the head of MPI at UCLA, which is the largest psychiatric center in, in the world. He talked to me as if I was his peer. In fact, he talked to me as if he could learn something from me. He begged me to come work for him and just assess the hospital. And he knew the VA at the time was not assessing Vietnam and didn't know how to deal with them. They weren't coming. And here he's got this U.S. Army captain that's just out of Vietnam who's, he, who can talk their language. And I called Bob and we had a place to stay. 
where he was staying over by USC and we drove down and the next day I was on the job. Before you know it, I'm sitting there talking to him. The one guy, David Carver, had been in LA for a year and David was telling me about all the areas of Venice because I hadn't really not known LA and I didn't know Venice Beach from Malibu or whatever. We went down to a famous pier that no longer exists called the POP Pier, Pacific Ocean Park Pier. It was a big amusement park pier. And David says, let me go show you where everybody is. And we go through this trap door and we enter into the pier. And it's literally a city of 350 homeless people. Most all of them are vets. And that's where my career started. That door opened and I never looked back. It's a psychological illness that some say plagues more than a million veterans of the Vietnam War. Tonight, Dan Rather continues the story. Treatment began here, in the hills of Malibu, California. His name is Shad Mishad. Bravo was his Marine Vietnam vet that had located up in the Coral Canyon area and recreated Vietnam. I was allowed to go in and work, and I was always under armed guard, and then I could only go up there on my motorcycle. I had to park. I had to be frisk and I went in just like I was going into a military compound. I did that for five years. I came down here, one guy, one guy was just bashing his, his head and his hands, he was all bloodied. And he was just trying to kill himself and he wanted to do it manly. He wasn't gonna cut his wrist or whatever, he just wanted to go out violently. And that's where I really learned how far away from society veterans were willing to go. But I, I kept getting guys in that were injured and getting them down and then they would go back and then eventually a lot of them reintegrated back into society. And that's really where I got my skill. Gave me a diagnosis for PTSD. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Please welcome Shad Mishad. I know you Shad, welcome to People Are Talking. Ross mentioned post-traumatic stress disorder. Shad, explain exactly what you mean by that. Well, post-traumatic stress disorders, it's, it's sort of an evolving clinical term for what used to be called post-Vietnam syndrome or delayed stress reactions, which has is, is become very popular. We knew that there was a condition going on that wasn't schizophrenia, wasn't character disorders. A young psychologist who had came back from Vietnam, a Marine, uh, Charles Figley, did his research in what he called stress reactions from trauma. And in 74, he met me, saw me in a, in a CBS piece. So we sort of hooked up and in 75, we went to the APA. We presented this concept of uh, delayed stress. He came out with a book in 78 called Delayed Stress Amongst Vietnam Veterans. All of a sudden, the APA, the American Psychiatric and the American Psychological started really looking at it. Basically, it's the experience of a catastrophic, life-threatening experience. And you survive it. And what you do, <clears throat> the mind uh, uh, as a protective device stores this or puts it away. You become almost freeze-dried, locked into yourself. You put it in a vault so you can move on. It's that kind of melts away. And the, the, all of a sudden you start having feelings, irritability, flashbacks intrusive thoughts, anger develops out of it, and rage. A smell could go by, any of your five senses will recreate the event that you experienced maybe a few years ago. This monster is lurking in this closet and when it opens up, uh, it jumps you. It's the normal reaction to an abnormal situation. It's not being crazy, it's a disorder. and People now can get help and get treatment. I carried around a 380 pistol all the time just because I was paranoid and uh, I was crazy. My name's Chad Ryber, Airborne Ranger. In Najaf, I got hit by an RPG, so I went home to Santa Barbara. I drank a liter and I went to this party in Isla Vista and this guy bumped into me, so I pulled it out, I loaded it and I pulled the trigger at his head and, and the weapon didn't go off. Got charged with assault with a deadly weapon and like five other felonies and I was facing five years. Right before that though, I met Chad. Uh, he interviewed me, you know, gave me a diagnosis for PTSD and I started working with him a little bit. And on that day of court, he came to court and testified on my behalf. And uh, I mean, he pretty much saved me from doing five years in prison. To actually help people and, and do positive things for not just yourself, but for everybody else, five days a week. And I mean, that makes me feel good inside. 
I guess in the early 80s, someone said, you ought to do your own thing. And I said, well, I am doing my own thing. At least I thought I was. I'm the founder and co-author of what we know as the Vet Center Program, which is in its 26th year of operation. Uh, as time went on, I realized that more and more that uh, I was, you know, a part of a program that I had authored and co-founded, but it was changing. A lot of the changes I didn't like were asking us not to go into prisons where at that time, or maybe even today, we had a lot of veterans in prison. We couldn't really talk about Agent Orange, which was a big issue in the Vietnam War. And uh, so I didn't want a veteran to ever have to call or contact us and say, oh, I can't go there. Hank Hahn, who was a uh, Annapolis graduate, flew fighter planes two years in Vietnam, kept pushing me. In 84, we started putting together, you know, the charter, the bylaws. We put our dream sheet together, and initially that's what we were. You know, we were going to be the united way for Vietnam veterans. We were going to raise $150 million a year. You, you build it, and they will come. Whoever they were, I didn't know. As we did eventually get, you know, our state charter and then our federal charter uh, by the end of 85, on paper, we were a paper organization. And we had a couple of events. Uh, one was with the screening of, of uh, First Blood, Rambo and First Blood. We raised our first $10,000. You know, we were operating out of my house. One of my bedrooms was turned into an office. We had like four or five combat Vietnam vet uh, board of directors. Let's going to introduce some special friends. Alan Gibson. Let's hear it for Alan. Board member, VDAF. Dan Fall, number 97. All right. Frank, the killer walker, number 100. Bernie Goodby, our main advisory board member. Most of them, they were all characters. I, I was, I mean, we were all characters. But we really didn't know uh, what we were facing. Historically, uh, we were on paper as the Vietnam Veterans Aid Foundation with this grandiose idea. And interesting enough, what happened was, uh, as an author on the Vietnam War, my book was read by Kate Knutson. That was the pop, as they say. It just started what we are today, started the run. Chad Mishad has, uh invested his life in helping veterans. Chad has been through a whole lot, and I'm gaining a lot of experience from working with him, and he's given me a lot of insight. Hi, uh, my name is Eric. I'm a veteran, but I'm not a combat vet. I was in the Navy, radio communications. If I weren't here today, I would be in prison, either or back on the street. I thank Chad, first of all, for the opportunity that he has provided for me to work at the NVF, being able to help another life. was uh, rewarding. He's always asking me, well, where are you at in your head? He's always concerned. So he's a, he's a good boss, but at the same time, he's a good person away from the job. Shad has life in him, and I see that. And he inspires me. <laughs> you know, he inspires me, encourages me to keep on moving. My book was read by Kate Knudsen, and she happened to be married to Keith Knudsen, who was one of the drummers for the Doobie Brothers, who had split up four years earlier. Bad blood, very few were talking to each other. The next thing you know, I get a phone call and he comes to my office and says, I'd like to introduce myself to you. He sits down and he says, I, I want to tell you who I am first. He said, before I was a doobie brother, I was a draft dodger, I burned my draft card. You know, it's such a nice pairing all these years later. You who protested the war yes. and mm -hmm. didn't want to go because you didn't believe in the cause, mm -hmm. joining up with someone who, who was in the war, in the combat zone, and working together and uh, helping everybody who was there. You still want to talk to me? You know, I burned my draft card. I said, I don't have any feelings. But I said, you're pretty lucky. I said, you're lucky, and you're lucky you didn't have to serve in Vietnam. Yeah, I think it's important to that the issues of that the war really have nothing to do with it. It's the warriors, the men and the women now, that uh, went over there and, and fought for us. Um, and I think that's the focus right now. And he asked me what I was up to, and I said, well, you know, got this nonprofit foundation on paper. I talked about what I wanted to do and what it was about, and what my dreams were about it. And he said, got an idea. How many more copies of that book you got? 
The U.S. military as a taxpayer works for me. And when a veteran signs his DD-214, he has effectively retired from my employ. Hi, my name is Todd Stenhouse. All matters of operational support. Grant writer, public relations specialist. So what does it say to me as one of 275 million CEOs of the company of the United States of America that one in three of the homeless men living on the streets of every community in my country are my retirees. When my retirees face increased risks for suicide, family employment problems, and substance abuse, we gotta do something about that. He sent him out with a letter to all the ex-members of the band Keith was the only member of the band that could talk to any clique. A couple of things happened. One was Keith had not heard back from all the band members, but he heard back from about half of them. Keith had a band, a country rock band called Southern Pacific, and he had John McPhee in it. And he decided that at least that group and any of the other talent in the area, they would do this homeless heroes feast. We only allowed the homeless to go into this concert and they would play continuously from like 12 noon till about five o'clock for five hours this group played and it was probably the greatest concert and I've been to some great ones that was ever put together. I never forget that day and they played to their hands were raw blisters on them. Their, their voices were hoarse. To listen to Bobby Caldwell and Michael McDonald harmonizing and Skunk Baxter, John McPhee, Keith Knutson, pieces of just bands that, had, that were doing other things just came and they jammed for five hours. Chad's whole approach, his whole philosophy on life and, uh, and giving back and making sure those people that have sacrificed for our freedoms are taken care of is just something that, uh, that just really struck a chord with me, just, just right, right at the center of, of who I was about and, and what I believed in. And um, he's, he's been a mentor, he's been a guide, he's been uh, a friend, um, a confidant, he's been a teacher. Um, Shad is one of those guys that uh, has lived a thousand lives and, and probably has a thousand more to live. Shad's like a father. He's like a father, boss, manager, uh, everything wrapped in one. If you got any problems, come on in, you know, tell me how it is, you know, get it out of your system and I'll get back to work. <laughs> My name's Christopher Hughes. I'm an Iraqi era veteran in the United States Marine Corps. I was working at a gym down in Marina Del Rey. Shad came up to me and, and uh, he started asking me about, you know, he's like, I heard you were a veteran. He's seen the way I was running things down there. He said, you know, hey, we're looking for a few good men. Come aboard my team. And uh, that was back in uh, February of, uh, of 2004. I've seen myself grow a lot since I've been here uh, with the foundation. And I want to introduce the man responsible for this whole concept of taking entertainment and raising money for the plight of those Vietnam veterans that are hurting today, 15, 20 years later, for all of you out there. That man, that man is Keith Knudsen. Word got out, we were in the newspaper. Before you know it, the other band guys heard about it. Everybody flew in. This is January of 87. And I met them all in the uh, one of the library rooms on the first floor of Patriotic Hall where we'd had that concert. And Keith went and embraced every one of them and Keith opened up the meeting. I tell you, if you don't know, I want to let you know why we're all here. I called all the doobies up to ask them to get back together to do this concert for Vietnam veterans. I got up there and I said, first of all, uh, when I arrived in LA and I had an eight track player and an old Volkswagen and all I played was doobies. I said, so the music vibrates through my body. Keith. Uh, looked at everybody and said, well, we need to know today, so I'm going to start off. And he threw his hand up and he says, I'm in. And I remember John McPhee's hand, Michael McDonald's hand went up. 
chatting and cracking, and then the hands just started popping up around the room. Everybody had their hand up. And the next thing we know, there's this press conference that on March the 12th or 15th, tickets were gonna go on sale at the Hollywood Bowl. And I called all the Doobie Brothers back up, uh, asked them if they would like to get together to do a benefit for Shad's Vietnam Veterans Aid Foundation, and they all agreed to do that. And we did do it at the Hollywood Bowl in May of 1987. Let's rock. How you doing, Chad? I tell you, this is something else. I'm, I'm, I'm numb. I can't believe this is going on. But it's happening. It's, this is a major benefit, the major benefit for the Vietnam Veterans Aid Foundation. And we had like 3,000 disabled vets that we got sponsors to buy tickets for, so we had a whole, the VIP seating were all Vietnam vets. I had a Vietnam vet open the show, my first patient who had a great voice, David Carver, opened the show. People have asked me if I'm nervous to be here tonight, no. and I said after Vietnam, <laughs> who can be nervous being here tonight? It was just incredible to see all that love. I mean, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I, I really had. It was, it was, it was mammoth. All of a sudden, you look up in the sky. It was a perfect night, and the, you see the Goodyear blimp rolling over. Our theme song was taking it to the streets because that's I've been a street counselor, and so I love that. So you saw taking it to the streets. Doobie Brothers benefit for Vietnam veterans, and it just rolled across that belly of that thing. Well, I just looked up and I said, you know, this is going to happen. The Soviet Union's war in Afghanistan is often referred to as Russia's Vietnam. They asked some of our veterans to come to Moscow. Bob Brown went 88, along. 89, oh, I, I went to Russia representing the National Veterans Foundation, sharing my work. All right, Bill, is this the beginning of world peace or what, huh? They all embraced me, and I, I don't know the Russian word, but they said that we, we now know that we are all one spirit. That was a pretty powerful thing. I never felt even when I didn't speak the language of communication Barry, when I was in my element, when it was doing what I do. The interesting thing that happened during the first 10 years is we discovered something very big and it's what sort of is our headliner for who we are and that was the toll-free number. You know, I always wanted a place where everybody could reach you. You couldn't say, well, I can't put 35 cents in the phone or whatever, or a homeless person on the street could pick up a pay phone. It was the toll-free was saving lives, getting people where they needed to be. It's a wonderful model that, that takes into account um, a holistic approach to serving these guys. It's not just trying to fit someone into a model that may not fully meet their needs. I had a guy in Iowa and he was stranded and he was at the Greyhound bus station. Hi, my name is Mike Washington, served in Panama, 76 to 79. I was in the Army, infantryman. I was able to to actually call the Greyhound bus station, get a ticket donated for him. It was in another city, but I had somebody pick him up there and take him over to the other bus station, and he was able to catch the bus down to San Francisco to Menlo Park. That was one of my, my claims of fame there. A lot of veterans are out there right now in the streets, and, they, and they, uh, they're homeless. Veterans out there that are lonely, uh, empty inside, uh, they still struggle. And this is a war going on inside, inside of each and every one of us. Here at the NVF, we run a crisis hotline. We're the only toll-free hotline of its type in the country, and we're an information referral service for veterans and their family. We don't only help veterans, we help anybody that calls us, really. I take phone calls, handle problems that veterans are experiencing. From a denial of a claim, or they may seek information regarding to a telephone number to seek help for alcoholism or drug addiction. All veterans that call in get a live voice. And just being able for a veteran to pick up the phone and just get somebody that actually knows and understands what's going on. One of the most important things you can give to any of the struggling veteran uh, is hope, uh, contact. The phone line, in a way, is, is actually as close to being intimate with someone you don't know as you can be. How are you? To be able to sit and talk I and mean, have that caring voice. I mean, it really sounds very elementary, but people need to talk. People need to talk.
you with the uh, Marines, right? Welcome. First of all, let me just tell you, welcome home. I used to spend the night on the streets. And the reason I did it for so many years is I wanted really to be as close to absorb what's going on inside of their head if they call our number from that position. It's one night on the streets, I'm aching for two or three days. It's just not what you think it is. I go into every call I'm thinking that because I don't know, but I, I don't want to be not ready to receive with feeling the worst, the worst scenario, and that's, that's what we do. And if that's what we do, we want to be the best at doing that. I received a letter from this, this concerned mother in New York. My name is Cornell Jones. I'm a, a Desert Storm Gulf War veteran, 1989 to 1993. His son was depressed and his son was going through a whole lot of things. He wanted to be in the military and he wanted to be a ranger. And he broke his hip in basic training and he wanted to get out right now. He was willing to sign anything just to get out even if it meant him getting a general discharge which is a downgraded discharge and you don't get all the same benefits. And Cornell was able to talk to him and ease his pain and uh, comfort him. For me talking to the mother and she talking to her son was able to make sure that he stayed in the military long enough so he can go before the medical board so that he can get out and get disability and go on with his life. It's changed over the years from the VVF to the NVF. And I think the change happened in the 90s, 91, 92, something like that. We were the Vietnam Veterans Aid Foundation from 85 to 91, which we changed our name to the National Veterans Foundation. So it wouldn't look like we were, you know, we were biased or we only work with Vietnam veterans. You see that in the phone book or you call, you think, oh my God, I wish I was a Vietnam veteran so I could call. So we, uh, we opened it up to the world. My name is Mike Young. I'm currently a counselor at the West Los Angeles VA PTSD clinic. I'm a veteran myself. I served in the Marine Corps. I was a student at Loyola Marymount University when I first met Chad. When I graduated in 1997, he offered me a position at the NVF that eventually turned into a full-time staff position as the director of operations. The, the late 90s was a rough time for the National Veterans Foundation in that um, there, it was difficult to get funding. Veterans were not a priority at that time. It was a very challenging time for both uh, both Shad and I and the, and the board of directors and the entire foundation. As director of operations at the time, I was taking on a whole bunch of different roles from doing public relations to marketing, um, fundraising, um, helping to manage our toll-free line. Luckily, we were able to make it through it. We were able to scrape by with some good friends and, um, and wonderful people that, uh, that were able to make it happen. We're always trying to get our PSAs out to the major markets within the U.S. If we're more visible, that means we'll get more calls. That means there'll be more people that we help out, which would bring in more donations. I'm Dan Loria. I was proud to serve my country during Vietnam, and now I'm proud to serve the National Veterans Foundation. Hello, I'm Oliver Stone. The trauma of war does not end on the battlefield. The Vietnam Veterans Aid Foundation is helping vets. The guys behind the VVAF are veterans who understand surviving peace. Um, where everybody knows who we are, knows what we're doing. There's public service announcements running. There's TV programs running. It's critical, critical work to make sure we're getting the word out. I urge you to support the National Veterans Foundation. Thank you. You know, the, the fundraising part is, 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 uh, is a difficult part. We put on the best celebrity golf tournaments in comedy shows, I think, ever. I'm just here to support them any way I can. And the rival any. I mean, our first show, we had Robin Williams and the Arnolds uh, to Jim Carrey to everybody in living color and that's the most powerful thing radio i said there's a tank shooting at us and the guy back in the rear says is it friendly <laughs> no it's shooting at us please welcome shad mishad <laughs> I appreciate hearing everyone speak, both sides, left and right. I hope we're all in this together. Would you please welcome Shad Mishad? Shad Mishad is a Vietnam vet, an authority on post-traumatic stress disorder, and president of the National Veterans Foundation. He joins us. We need to outreach more. We need more outreach-type projects. Right. 
Uh, many people were watching this on television, um, people in the Ventura Learning Center. I'm, I'm very, very excited today to, to be able to present a person who hardly needs any, any introduction here at UCSB. He's one of my closest and dearest friends. His name is Shad Meshad. Now, I want to introduce right now our special guest for this evening's show. This situation now is really about the soldiers. Our Delphine Metcalf Foster, Ward Payne, and Shad Meshad. Hey, how you doing? The XRL donates a large percentage of its proceeds to the National Veterans Foundation. Our vets, you can't put a price on what we owe them. We dedicate this round to our nation's veterans, to all the men and women who have served and sacrificed for our freedom. Let's give all our vets a hand, folks. It's all about you guys. John was trained to track down the enemy and destroy him. It's a skill he'd use back home years later. I was very angry. John Kaveny, desperate to kick heroin, led a six-week hunger strike against the VA. I'll never forget one of my oldest Shad cousins. helped mediate the strike's end. But promises by the government were not kept. John Kaveny, feeling enraged and betrayed, targeted Shad Meshad as the enemy. Now he wanted Shad dead. And there it was. It was just like I blinked. It was like a genie came over. It was John Kevin. He's got a 12-inch knife at my throat. He was charged with attempted murder and kidnapping. He called Shad Meshad. Incredibly, thanks to the man he tried to kill just 48 hours before, John was spared from a life in prison. You did not press charges. No, I dropped those. Dropped the charges. John Kevin now runs what is widely regarded as the most successful program for homeless vets in the country. He said, Dear Shad, I owe my life to you and a couple of other people, and that is the truth, so help me God. I owe you a debt of gratitude for a second chance and for being sober today. You gave out all you can with a glad, free heart, and you do all you can for others. But back will come countless stores of blessing. For all the changes, one thing in John's life is the same. Shad is part of it. The man he once tried to kill is now his closest friend. The power of what we do drives you to do things and drives you to do whatever within reason you can do to, to constantly try to supply veterans and their families and kids with things that they need. Saving Private Ryan was the most watched movie this weekend. We got some money from DreamWorks when Pri Saving Private Ryan came out because of the impact. It looked familiar. I was there. It brought back memories, I tell you. In that 20 minutes, the opening of the film is forever. And I have uh, spoken with and worked with World War II vets that talk and have talked forever about minutes. For about six months, to even that the first year from the time the film opened, the first year, our calls went from like maybe a hundred calls from World War II vets to a hundred calls a week. We're talking about their readjustment problems, that they had uh, suppressed many problems and, and, and had a lot of problems that they didn't realize that they were eligible for services for. So one of the stories was a call that I received about seven years ago, Christmas week, and I happened to be in the office late one night and I have a knee-jerk reaction. The phone rang and I picked it up and it was a World War II vet from the East Coast who said that his wife had Alzheimer's and that he was now legally blind. And he, he had never asked for anything. He fought at the Battle of the Bulge and he wanted to know if there was anything we could do. He needed to feed his wife. He said, my wife most of the time doesn't know who I am. She's kind to me or whatever and that's painful enough. And it's, you know, I'm legally blind. I can navigate the house, but can't drive. I can't go get food. And I sat and must've talked to him for an hour. It sort of made my Christmas to sit and tell him that don't worry, don't worry, help is coming. We had a loss this year with Keith Knudsen, the drummer, you know, was, he was really pro-vet. Yeah, when I look back on our history, uh, I think of Keith Knudsen, number one. 
this past February, he passed away. And in March, we had a memorial service. And the one thing that I have over my desk at my office at home is the drum head that Keith beat until it tore. That first concert, five hours for the homeless. And he wrote on their brother's shed, we will be brothers forever. You call me anytime, anywhere, I'll always be there for you. This is just the beginning. Love, Keith. He saw the need and he dedicated the rest of his life to, to that need. But everybody loved him. And that energy, that spirit still permeates through this whole organization. It's not a sad thing. I mean, the sadness is in the loss of what he gave, which was so much. KGO Radio News Time 604. Good evening. This is the this week the KGO Spotlight is being dedicated to our troops, to those returning from Iraq and Afghanistan, some of them physically wounded, others emotionally scarred by combat. So joining us by phone, it's a pleasure to welcome Shad Meshad. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Shad. Thank you. Hey, Shad, can you shed some light on this question of, of what makes this a different conflict? I still think that the coming home... Even though there's been tremendous changes over the last 35 years, uh, and particularly the last 25 years, it's still uh, one of those things where it's very difficult, particularly for co combat soldiers, men or women, to reach out for help. It's really the, a journey in, in a very different setting, quite different than Vietnam. It's, it's almost, uh, it's even a little different than Afghanistan, but uh, we're, we're learning. We're learning as we go along, but unfortunately, uh, the cost is, is tremendous. The type injuries, the brain injuries, are quite different. Losing a leg and losing, you know, parts of your brain and your vision and things like that. It, it's pretty horrific. We're, you know, we're already seeing that. We know that. It's just what we're going to do about it. Continuing to do workshops in that as I do and as I will be doing for several years with the individuals that are still living with the aftermath of such a horrific event. We're here today really to just talk about this current war and yourselves. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff. Sean, tell us about the young man that decides to go to, uh, to the Marine Corps. Where, um, where are we going back to? September 11th happened and when those towers fell, you know, all of our security was now in question and how that fear manifested itself with me was, was uh, rage. And I know it's hard to let go of that rage. It's very controlling. And, you know, every one of us have felt it in one way or another. My best friend was killed right in front of me. I mean, I was still so pissed off about that. I can't get that out of my head. And uh, I mean, the rage is still there. It was driving me crazy. My thirst three and a half years back, it was killing me physically, and I was a therapist on the streets here in L.A. There's something comforting about the rage. It was comforting. Oh, I can I, get, I don't want to let go of the rage, I know. to be honest with yeah. you. I don't want to let go no, of it, because no. it makes me feel warm, and it makes me feel like I got yeah. a purpose. Behind those eyes, I've seen a lot. That's like having that M50 that feels great. It's excitement, but it's it's false. My platoon commander, he was actually killed over there. Never took into the fact that we might actually kill somebody. This isn't a fantasy. This isn't a dream. I'm not going to wake up tomorrow and everything's going to be gone. I just had difficulty feeling much of anything other than anger. You know, I mean, it was like I was real in touch and still in, in touch, you know, with anger, rage. I'm comfortable. <laughs> I'm very comfortable being angry. I'm like Sean, you know, I'm, I get pissed off. At, at anything. What sets you off? You know, different things. There's a lot of things that yeah. set me off. Right, I mean, well, no, I, no, I, go first. I, I, don't, I don't think I could point to like one specific thing that sets me off. Well, let's start at the top and work your way down. The number whatever one thing, the thing I'm most passionate about, the, the media. Absolutely 100% the, the news. They mislead, they twist the truth as much as is humanly possible to portray the sacrifices that these guys make to turn that into something else. That is my chief complaint. People that don't pay attention to what's going on, that, that rages me right there. 
they don't show what's real. Hey, he turns on the news and he says three more U.S. personnel were killed in Iraq today. They'll talk about it, but they don't show what's real. Why can't we see if the little three-year-old Iraqi girl got her head blown off because troops uh, happened to open fire on a, mistakenly on a checkpoint? That's something that happens in war. And, what, and you but, should what, see the results of it. The guys were burning. I started smelling burning flesh and... You know, this is real. And I, I don't dispute what I did in Iraq. I, I killed people in Iraq. I'm not going to dispute that. If you go to war, that your people die when you go to war. I mean, that's just the job. You should see the bodies coming home in the flag draped coffins. You should see the wounded people in this war. They might be showing it around the clock, but they're showing the Clorox bleach version of it. For the media to turn around and portray that as something other than what it is, and what it is is an extraordinary sacrifice. All those guys are going to be out eventually, and then what? They're not troops anymore, they're not soldiers anymore, so who's supporting them? Nobody is. All that stuff disappears as soon as you get out. I, I would say like it's uh, what I, I perceive to be a complete and total disconnect between those of us who have served in, uh, in a combat zone versus everyone else, basically. I'm up to 38 people that I know, you know, we're friends with that have since passed away. It's as real as life can be. I mean, I, I really do believe that. I mean, death is about, I mean, being around all that death and that destruction, responsible for it even, is about as real as life can be. And uh, that's, the, that's the thing I struggle with. His job is to make sure he comes home alive and tells the story. His job is to come home and take care of his family. In Najaf, I got hit by shrapnel. I had a stroke from the concussion and uh, I came back home. As much as I think that our families and our friends and, and spouses, whatever, know that we've been through something and that it's inevitably, it's got to have changed us because of the, the intensity of the experience, they still expect you to still kind of be like, you know, the same guy. When I came home, I couldn't even talk to someone over the phone. Didn't smile, felt a feeling in my face and a feeling in my gut, you know, that feeling that you get right here. Didn't really know what to do, what to say. There's a lot of things going on, you know, inside my head. I had a lot of emotion and I'm trying not to be too overloaded with. My concern, obviously, is the emotions and how that affects your life and you've got a long life in front of you. Going off as young men and getting that uniform and discipline and fighting for what we think is righteousness and we come back and we feel violated because we haven't had righteousness done to us of all people. It's the biggest contradiction. It creates more nightmares down the road as you get older than actually what happened in combat. We also know physically that rage destroys the body. The thing that I'm here forever for you guys is the fact that emotionally we got to cross over and first thing that I will do and spend the rest of my professional life is to get rid of the rage out of you. Well, somehow you've got to make peace inside. What I see is you're still fighting the world in the way it is and, and we can change it but it won't change with you living in rage because it will it will crush you in the future. It will eventually alienate you from everybody. You won't be able to be around anybody. What are you doing about your transition for your wife and family? Um, I, I recently, I, I recently uh, started going uh, going down to the to the VA. Psych, man. I don't watch Today. the news. Okay. I don't watch war movies. I don't watch anything that pertains to current events. Nothing. I try to completely extricate myself from that, if at all possible. Also, uh, my wife and I, you know, we came here, and that's when we met. And yeah. And uh, that's you know, open to you. Yeah, I knew that this was a place that was safe and it was somewhere I could reach out to and that, that I could, you know. I, this I could, place, this yeah. place is here for you. Yeah. And we've been here, I've been around for 35, but the foundation's been here 20, and I, this is your house. Take this message